First of all, I'd like to thank all of you for coming. It's a really, this is fa fabulous. It's a, a more attendance than uh, what I've been told we're going to have. And also thanks uh, you to the folks that are uh, streaming live uh, and uh, participating today. So it's a really, really a fantastic hour we hope to have for you. Um, my name is Tom Sarama. Uh, I'm chief engineer for the Raytheon Missile Systems. Uh, and with great pleasure, I'd um, like to welcome you to uh, Defense Dialogues. The future of missile defense, we have some unbelievable uh, speakers here to explore on the panel, uh, the growing development of missile defense and the implications of our, co our country going forward. Once again, thank you uh, for being here today. It's an important kickoff to the week, um, and we think it's a great event to have. Uh, last year was very, very successful, and we hope this year will be the same. Raytheon plays a pivotal role as the world's largest missile maker. But missile defense is a team sport. Uh, it is, takes a colossal effort from our government uh, and industry teams to ensure protection for our country, our allies, and most importantly, our people in our way of life. I'm honored to be in such good company uh, as, as here tonight. Uh, I am totally honored uh, with working with our uh, government uh, organizations. Um, and uh, what we do for this country is highly important, and it is very much an honor to be part of it. Today, we will begin our program with a fireside chat uh, before moving into the panel discussions. It is my pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Brigadier General Spielman, who is very, very kind in his very, very busy schedule to spend a little bit of time with us today. Uh, uh, general Spielman is the commanding general for the 32nd Army and Air Missile Defense Command. Joining General Spiel uh, Spielman is gonna be uh, Dr. Tom Carrico, a senior fellow with the International Security Program and a director of missile defense program at the Strate uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies. Let's please give them a warm welcome. Uh, General Spillman, thanks for, for being here. Uh, I know you just flew in from the, the Mideast last night, uh, providing uh, uh, missile defense for, for that region. I thought we'd really kick it off just by having you uh, give a description of your command uh, and your priorities, and then go from there. Great. Well, Tom, thanks. Uh, thanks for that, and um, uh, thanks for the invitation to participate in defense dialogues. Uh, I'm really pleased to be here. And as mentioned, I just came back from the Middle East last night, so I'm a little, a little tired, but that's okay. I think I can work through this. But uh, so, anyways, uh, 32nd Army Air Missile Defense Command. Uh, we're out of Fort Lewis, Texas. Um, and I won't get too much of the detail about the actual mission per se, but generally what I do is I provide trained and ready forces to combatant commanders, air and missile defense forces. Uh, that would be Patriot, that would be THAAD, that would be counter rockets and artillery, uh, mortar capabilities to combatant commanders. I currently have uh, four brigades and 13 battalions. Uh, we've got uh, one brigade headquarters uh, deployed to the United States Central Command, AOR, uh, all the time. I always have three Patriot battalions that are deployed, and, and right now I currently have a THAAD battery out of Fort Lewis, Texas that is uh, deployed to the Republic of Korea. But overall, about 8,500 soldiers. Uh, we comprise about 77% of the active component air defense artillery. Well, uh, I thought I would uh, just sort of connect that with the, the explicit theme of the conference, which is kind of enabling multi-domain battle. Uh, when I look at the slides that General Perkins from TRADOC puts out there, you see the slide with missiles going everywhere. Uh, and I think it was just last week that General Hodges uh, over in, in Europe uh, was quoted as saying, look, in, in an actual crisis, there would be, he said, lots, comma, lots of missiles uh, flying everywhere. Uh, so I wonder if you might connect, kind of connect your roles with, with multi-domain battle and how it, and why it's so important for that. Well, I would just tell you, I mean, I mean, from where I sit as a 32nd WMBC commander, I mean, it'd be hard to really connect what I do every day to a multi-domain battle um, in terms of a, uh, as a concept that's currently in development. But what I can speak to in terms of overall requirements for air missile defense um, and how they would contribute in the future to the multi-domain battle construct. Um, and just I'll just start real briefly. Um, you know, one of the things that... Um, that is absolutely imperative for the United States Army in terms of air missile defense is to, is to field a capability that allows us to network the force, to be able to, to, be able to put launchers, be able to put radars of various sorts, including joint radars, onto a network 
to achieve an integrated fire control network. I need that today in my formation uh, to be to be able to have the flexibility to deploy tailored air and missile defense forces in support of a geographic combatant commander. Um, now, that, that capability, many in this room are familiar with the Integrated Air Missile Defense Battle Command System. It's the number one priority within the Department of the Army for air and missile defense. It's absolutely crucial because it provides that flexibility that I need as a commander uh, to support the geographic combatant commanders, but also it provides a launch point uh, from where we may one day be able to achieve multi-domain fires. Whereas we're putting basically defensive shooters, air missile defense, onto a network, and on that same network, putting offensive shooters, you know, think uh, attackers, you know, uh, putting that onto a network, an integrated fire control network, where on the one hand, we can defeat uh, ballistic missiles and other air threats that are threatening our defended assets, and in near real time, send ammunition the other direction to uh, defeat the adversary who wants that capability. So, so I mean, generally speaking, there, there is no direct relationship between 30-second multi-domain battle, but I can tell you in terms of warfighter requirements, uh, you can make the case where, where IDCS is central to that, and that uh, in order to achieve some degree of multi-domain fires, at least in the, the land and air domain, we need, uh, we need IDCS. You know, um, in late 2013, uh, Chairman Dempsey put out the uh, uh, IAMD Vision 2020, uh, which really sort of emphasized uh, and foot stomped the importance of integrated air and missile defense. Uh, but in many respects, that vision, <laughs> sorry about this, uh, in many respects, that, that vision seems uh, uh, very far away. And I, so I wonder if you might uh, kind of Hey, this would be a good time to kind of walk through from the lower tier, if pick and up, uh, kind of how that uh, integration is going, uh, how far away that the implementation of that vision uh, still is. Well, we still have some work to do. Um, generally speaking, we're moving in the right direction. Um, I think, uh, as I stated earlier, uh, the sort of the central piece to air and missile defense modernization is IBCS. A number of programs within the Army in terms of our modernization strategy are linked to IBCS as a program. Um, you mentioned indirect fires protection capability increment two, block one, uh, which I think is an absolutely vital capability for the United States Army. Um, the long and the short of IBCS is that it gives us a multi-mission launcher that can be loaded out with a variety of interceptors that can counter cruise missiles and unmanned aerial systems. Today, our challenge uh, with respect to those threats I really don't have much capability to engage in except for firing a Patriot missile, uh, or in some cases against some unmanned aerial systems, uh, a Stinger missile. We got to have something in between, and we need a we need a uh, a multi-mission launcher uh, that can defeat uh, cruise missiles at the appropriate range. Um, and, and I'm just going to sort of segue here, just just briefly, uh, based on, and talk about what I've been seeing just in the central command area of responsibility here, just in the last couple of months. And all this is in open source reporting, but uh, just take a look at uh, what's been going on in and around Syria. It's rather astonishing in terms of the types of air threats that we're seeing. And just that period of time, we've seen the Russians fire sea-launched and air-launched cruise missiles. We've seen some malign forces flying armed UAS that have been shot down by the United States Air Force. We've seen Iran use ballistic missiles to, to target tactical formations in, in eastern Syria. And so, and then you've seen the Syrian Air Force try to fly a fixed wing fighter, an SU-22, that was shot down by an F-A-18. So, I and mean, that's just within the last two months. And so, I, but I think it's representational as to the kind of air threat that the United States, United States Army and our joint force may see in the future um, in potentially a European context or in other contexts. So, you know, that's why I talk a lot about air missile defense modernization, why IBCS is so central to that, why IFPIC as a program is crucial in order to achieve a layered air defense capability to defend uh, our defended assets. And then you throw on top of that 
uh, given the uh, emergence of the low, slow, small UAS and how they've been used by Russian-backed separatists uh, in the Ukraine. Um, the requirement for a maneuverable shorehead capability has just been codified by the United States Army. So ultimately, you know, we can even talk about, you know, strategic weapons. I, ICBMs are being developed by the Republic of Korea that everybody's aware of and other types of threats. Um, what we need to have, generally speaking, at the operational and tactical levels of war, we need to have a layered air defense capability, not just within the United States Army, but within our joint services. And so I don't think it's to your question, but uh, but generally speaking, we, we have to uh, we have to get after this in probably a bigger way than what we're doing right now. We need to have we have a vision. Um, we have a uh, air missile defense uh, strategy. Um, ultimately, what is required for the United States Army to achieve this goal is number one, the Army needs consistent, reliable funding uh, by our Congress and from the administration. Um, today, the United States Army is funded at about funded at 2009 level, so about 60% of what we were funded in 2009 is what we're funded today. So ultimately speaking, there needs to be greater investment, uh, not just in the United States Army, but our other services. But in the Air Missile Defense Portfolio, uh, there's, no, there's no substitute for being uh, adequately funded. Now, I would tell you that within the United States Army, in terms of Army modernization, prioritization, Air Missile Defense stacks very high. So... You know, I feel good about that, but ultimately, uh, ultimately requires greater focus and interest from the United States Congress on, on um, air and missile defense. Well, let me kind of walk up from sort of the low, the low tier. If pick block one, you mentioned, uh, what's block two, and what comes after block two as we kind of move the integration upwards, especially towards. Well, the block area. one is really designed to, it's uh, the, to get the multi-mission launcher out to the field and be able to counter cruise missiles and unmanned aerial systems. Block two, which is much further out takes us back to a focus on defeating rockets, artillery, and mortar with other potential capabilities such as high energy laser, uh, other particular small miniature interceptors that can take on those little small, small threats. Uh, but that's pretty much, uh, that's further down the line. Um, and uh, the technology is maturing. I've seen some demonstrations of that technology, but but ultimately we have to, we have to translate that into no kid, no capability that can be fielded to army formations and that can be employed uh, in such a way as to account for those threats. So you mentioned cruise missiles, uh, and you're talking about kind of the, the networks that put these things together to, to act quickly upon them, but uh, what about the sensor side? It's both the 360-degree radar and an elevated sensor. You know, the Army's been kind of looking at a 360 radar for 25 years or so, and I wonder if you might kind of say about the importance of that and the timing of that. Well... Currently, our, our current radars that exist at Patriot are very capable radars, and, and I can speak with some degree of authority about our Patriot radar. It is a very capable radar, and with continued modernization of the Patriot radar, software upgrades, hardware upgrades, the feeling of the Pac-3 missile segment enhanced uh, capability, uh, we are keeping pace with the threat. Um, however, um, the Patriot weapon system has been in existence for more than three decades now. And there's only so much that you can do to continue to modernize that that radar. So the Army does require a radar beyond Patriot. Uh, it is an ongoing effort within the Department of the Army to identify uh, the way ahead uh, and a material solution to that. And there's plenty of plenty of information out there in the out there in the open media about the current Army status of uh, the radar following Patriot. But uh, but it's an absolute requirement. We see evolving. Threats from regional actors, uh, you know, maneuverable RVs, um, you know, other types of capabilities that adversaries are currently uh, pursuing that would uh, make it difficult for us to execute air missile defense with the current Patriot radar that exists today. So you mentioned the uh, MML, uh, the multi-mission launcher. Uh, it kind of reminds me when I think about it is for the, the Aegis VLS and you put offense defense in there, you put a lot of different effectors in there. Uh, should that be a kind of a model or template for other aspects of Army Air and Missile Defense? Well, I'll tell you, one of the stories about, about if pick increment two, block one, which comprises is comprised with the uh, the multi-mission launcher, which is the, the only really new capability that if pick is bringing. Um, and oh, by the way, it's it's government designed a prototype. Um, and the, you know, the important thing about if pick is that um, 
it gives you that that layered defense capability that, I've, that I'm speaking of. I mean, in a single launcher within a platoon, you have the ability to upload 60 interceptors of various types. Uh, they can defeat a range of threats. And so um, to me, that is, um, that is where we need to go in the future in terms of air missile defense capability. It is about achieving a layered defense um, at echelon uh, at the operational level and the tactical level. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but great. Um, and what about another aspect? Uh, uh, Vision 2020 said we need a, a, I think it was a robust attention to passive defense. I'm thinking both in terms of the defended asset and also the air missile defense force itself. Yeah, well, passive defense, one of the pillars of air and missile defense is absolutely crucial. Um, it is a, an area that has not been paid enough t attention to over the years. Um, you know, uh, I would just tell you that um, we're not going to be able to buy our way out of this air and missile defense problem set that we have. Um, we're not going to be able to shoot down everything, um, defeat every threat. So it's incumbent upon us as a joint force to... Uh, to get after our passive air defense skills uh, much more robustly than we have in the past. Um, these are relatively simple things to implement. Um, and I think um, you know, ultimately um, we can do a lot to negate the effectiveness of the range of air threats uh, that we face by simply doing some of the smart things that we used to do fairly commonly in the past, you know, dispersion and hardening. Uh, you know, in, our, in terms of our tactical formations, fighting at night, um, you know, those kinds of things are, these are things that, that obviously we should be doing right now. And from, from a passive defense perspective in terms of air and missile defense capability, it's not traditionally part of the passive defense um, sort of construct, but ultimately as a force we need to, there's some sort of, sort of efficiencies that can be gained uh, just within the air defense force if we, we come up with other ways to to um, present a problem to our adversaries. So I'm talking about electronic decoys. I'm talking about other types of things that we can do to, to, uh, to provide a, uh, a different look that the adversary may see to enable us to uh, uh, survive more effectively on the battlefield. Just in my own command, uh, one of the things that I've, uh, I've, I've put a lot of focus on is the ability of our fire units, our Patriot fire units and our battalions to move not just in an expeditionary fashion, but in a tactical fashion, and to be able to move battalions over operational distances under their own power and their own protection. And then to be able to place Patriot fire units to defend an asset, and then uh, very quickly uh, move that Patriot battery somewhere else to also defend that asset. So uh, this is an ongoing effort. Uh, there's a lot of things that we should be doing that we haven't done in the past, but we need to put more focus on. So ultimately, you know, General Milley says, Right, you know, if you you stay in one place too long, you're going to die. Right, that's absolutely true with uh, with uh, with a Patriot weapon system. It's a tough thing to to deal with in terms of defending Patriot. It's a big radar; it's easily spotted. Uh, but ultimately, you can't allow yourself to be targeted by long range munitions by staying in one place for at one time. Um, there's a variety of other threats out there to uh, air defense forces that we have to deal with. Many of you may recall the news reports of a uh, North Korean unmanned aerial system flying down a Daegu and taking a look at the uh, Thad battery that we had there, and then returning, attempting to return back to North Korea and crashing short of the DMZ. I mean, they, that's a real threat. Right? That's something that we have to pay attention to. And as a force, air missile defense force, we need to be able to defend ourselves against that threat. Great. Um, and uh, I think the idea is we'll, we'll take a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, so you just want to raise your hand, and we'll we'll go from there. I'll repeat the question uh, so we have it. But uh, who wants to to chime in? Oh, we have a, we have a mic. Right here. Yeah. Uh, Tom asked you. Well, thank oh, you. Okay. Yeah. You uh, yeah. identify yourself. Yeah. 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 Mark Bernstein from Lincoln Laboratory. Tom asked you uh, about the 360 radar, which you answered, but he also had in there about a radar up high to look for low flying cruise missiles or other threats which again has been on the drawing board for the Army. You know, Jay Lenz was in or was out. I think it's out now. But the need is still, the requirement is still there. Are you looking at uh, how you might satisfy that? Well, I'm not aware of any ongoing efforts right now to do anything beyond what, what has already existed with Jay Lenz. And of course, you know, everybody's aware of what happened in that program. But, uh, but, but you speak to an important point. In order to defeat cruise missiles effectively, the shooters have to be queued. 
And of course, uh, you know, cruise missiles can be launched over the horizon. And we do need a capability to detect cruise missiles launched from over the horizon. Um, as of right now, I know of no ongoing efforts to uh, come up with a material solution to, uh, to give us that capability. Um, but, uh, I mean, there's potential, I guess, ways that there's other things that we potentially may be able to, be able to do with uh, IBCS equipped formations that maybe will help us, but this requires a lot more thought. Okay. Good. Who else we got? Well, I've got plenty more th things to ask while they're thinking about it. Um, you mentioned uh, ATACMS, and you mentioned kind of the integration of of, uh, of uh, offensive fires. Mm -hmm. uh, what's kind of what is kind of the vision there? And could there be, as it were, more of a even more of a blending between Fort Sill and Fort Bliss in terms of mixing and matching these forces? Well, I mean, you, many have heard what, what General Milley has said about uh, the multi-domain task force. Um, that effort, conceptual effort, is well underway right now. Um, ultimately, the Fire Center of Excellence will design a a task organization construct that will that will I, you know which will define what the uh, multi-domain task force will look like. Uh, but in terms of uh, the land domain and the air domain. Um, our ability to achieve multi-dimensional fires, in my mind, already exists to a degree. Um, one of the things that that I believe is that um, you could put a Patriot ICC in a long-range precision fires or TACMS, an FA battalion uh, shooter, uh, rocket shooter uh, battalion FDC together side by side. And you could put a command post in between those two assets. And uh, you could have an ability to execute both defensive fires and offensive fires against pre-planned targets, pre-planned pre -planned responses, uh, just by doing that. I think that exists today. Um, it's a question of uh, taking the concept and developing leaders and tinkering with it and trying it out. Uh, but right now, we could do that today. As we field IBCS, as I said earlier, um, when you can be able to do this and put uh, the shooters and the radars onto the network, both offensive and defensive fires, uh, that just expands the capability to do that in the future. And so you, you talked about the, uh, the ICCs and other things. What, what could be done to get at the integration problem more in the very near term? Um, not sort of the, the 2020s time frame. What could be done right now to, to, to connect, to get, get, excuse me, get greater connectivity, either through a tent or something else, um, within the Patriot Force to, to fires, maybe to Patriot and Thad, stuff like that? Yeah, I mean, you know, part of it's having a vision, which is being defined, you know, about integration, multi-domain integration. Um, but really, I mean, the most important step is just to go out and try it. You know, go out there and do it. Pick a couple units, put them out in the field, take them to Yuma or White Sands, you know, fire a ballistic missile, have Patriot conduct the engagement, and at the same time, you know, before the intercept actually even occurs, the attackums is going the other direction because we know where the tell was. All right, we have good ISR. And uh, we've targeted. I mean, when you think about achieving that, I mean, that, that has a deterrent effect, right? When you have a demonstrated capability to not just be a catcher's mitt, right, but at the same time be able to throw something in the other direction. If you're an adversary and you, know how that, you have that demonstrated capability, that gets into your calculus about whether or not you're going to you know, conduct an attack using a ballistic missile. So th these are things that are, I mean, so the integration piece, the, the hardest part about integration is just taking that first step in some cases and trying things and uh, not being afraid of, uh, you know, screwing it up. Just keep trying. And I say, like I say, if you take a look at even the, some of the other domains, we have those capabilities today as well. We have cyber capabilities. We have electronic warfare capabilities. <clears throat> you know, so it's really, uh, it's, Moving rapidly from the conceptual to the to the actual concrete, 
in reality and actually trying it out. But uh, the, the work that the fire center is doing right now at, at Fort Sill is very important to identify that conceptual construct. Um, but we should be uh, we should be trying that out much more rapidly, I think. You know, uh, I think oh, James right here. Hi, sir. Uh, James from Aviation Week. Um, do you feel that there is an imbalance between uh, the the U.S. rocket forces uh, when facing a potential adversary like Russia, and also on the Korean Peninsula, since both those uh, forces pump a lot of money into uh, rocket development? Um, so, do you think there's an imbalance there? And also on JLens, um, the demise of that program. Do you think that was an overreaction? Um, do you think that there is a, still a need for that capability? Do you, do you think pulling funding for that was an overreaction given that it was an equipment malfunction? Um, well, can you restate the first part of your question just so I have that? Uh, can, can, I, can I try to restate it? The, capa the, uh, the requirement for the capability for JLens or some kind of elevated sensor didn't go away, correct? Right. That's correct. And then what are we doing to... Was that a mistake, and should there be something going after? Well, I mean, we spent a lot of money on J lens. We spent an awful lot of money on J lens, and um, you know, we had that problem. And um, you know, I'm not going to say whether it was a good idea or a bad idea. I'll just, I'm not sure if J lens was the right solution or not. But, but ultimately, um, it proved it didn't prove viable for for a variety of reasons, and. Um, I mean, it could have, uh, you know, throw enough money at it and throw enough training at it. You know, could we have elevated sensors right now? Absolutely, we could. But, but ultimately, you can't spend that kind of money, have a sort of a catastrophic failure like that, and not expect an adverse result. And so, um, I, I can understand why a decision was made by Congress to defund that program. Um, I'm not going to argue whether it was a good or bad decision. I'll just say that uh, I understand why they made that decision. But ultimately, um, the requirement still exists. And the first part of your question, yeah. Yeah, well, um, yeah, I mean, we do have that imbalance. It's ultimately a sufficiency question. Do we have enough combat power capacity uh, in the Republic of Korea? Um, it's been a long time since I've been stationed in Korea, but um, I know the ROC Army is very capable. They have a, a significant amount of artillery themselves, rocket artillery. Um, but I, I'm familiar with the North Korean threat. It's, it's not enough, obviously. And um, I just heard in, in the news today that it uh, looks like uh, we're, we're going to seek to help the ROC Army um, put a higher payload on some of the long-range shooters. Um, so I, I don't really have a good answer to the question. Um, I guess one of the issues that we have sort of consistently is having a sufficient quantity of munitions uh, to be able to deal with the threats that we're facing. Uh, again, it's a number one, it's a high priority within the Department of the Army to uh, to procure the uh, the requ requisite amount of, of, of munitions, both uh, long-range rocket artillery, attack and SIMRS, and along uh, along with uh, Patriot and THAAD missiles. And so, um, you know, it's always a tough challenge for the United States Army to deal with. You know, do you want to spend billions of dollars on munitions that you put in ASPs? Or do you want to spend your money to build a, the capability that can fire those munitions? And so it's a constant trade that, that the Army has to make. And um, I do believe, though, however, there's, there's greater interest uh, to increasing our stock so that we, can, uh, that we can have that credible capability to counter the threat. Well, let me just uh, close it out by saying you kind of alluded to this new vision that's hopefully working its way forward. Uh, I think the last air and missile uh, defense strategy for the Army was in 2012. Any hint about when something, some new vision might be out? Well, we've had a Waypoint One update uh, to uh, the, the vision that was published in 2012. Um, it's pretty good, uh, pretty good update. Uh, however, um, we probably have reached a time, and I'm, I'm not, if I'm not mistaken, I think Army Space and Missile Defense Command may be looking at another effort to update the Air and Missile Defense Strategy to sort of uh, address some of the realities that we've seen. We've had some fact of life changes with respect to programs. Um, in their maturation. Um, we've had some greater evolution 
of, uh, of air threats. And so I believe it's probably time we take another look at uh, air missile defense strategy. And as I said, I think Army Space and Missile Defense Command is doing that. Great. Well, General, thank you. This has been a privilege. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. For sure. We're going we're to go ahead and get started. Uh, we've got uh, with us Dr. Mark Bernstein, the Associate Director of, uh, of Lincoln Labs, uh, who's been uh, involved in missile defense in one way or another since 1987. Also spent a good bit of time at, at, uh, at MDA. Uh, we've got uh, Tom Samer in the, in the middle here, uh, Chief Engineer of Raytheon Missile Systems, who you've already met. Uh, and we've got uh, Richard Defada, Director of Future Warfare uh, Center at uh, US Army, SMDC, and RSTRAT. Um, I thought we might just sort of um, kick it off with a, with a broad question uh, about kind of uh, some of the technological prospects that are uh, kind of on the horizon or in the current program of record and what you see is kind of especially critical uh, to emphasize and perhaps especially promising. And I thought, Mark, we might, okay. uh, actually, well, why before, actually, let me, let me change that. Why don't we just sort of walk down the row and kind of have some opening remarks about your general thoughts and then we'll move to move Okay. To I messed it up sure. a bit there. Okay, well, I'll talk, uh, since uh, the general talked a lot about uh, some tactical systems uh, for the Army, Patriot, that, and uh, other uh, uh, command and control systems. Uh, I'll switch it up. I'll talk a little bit about defense of the entire United States. Of course, uh, we're all reading every day in the papers. Pick your favorite paper. New York Times, Washington Post, Huntsville something. Uh, it's a Redstone Rocket. Yeah, Redstone Rocket, yeah. Uh, the, pay, the pace of the uh, North Koreans uh, testing uh, is just astounding. And uh, for most people who have been in this business for a while, it's, it's actually, and I think for most citizens of the U.S., it's pretty frightening. And uh, so one good thing is uh, the leadership uh, for the Department of Defense and, uh, and the administrations going back uh, quite a ways. Uh, built, really started out as a test bed under General Kadish uh, to build out a uh, operational test bed uh, that could be used in an emergency. So this started, you know, we're 15 years about into that and it looks like, you know, we're going to really need that capability. Uh, hopefully we'll never have to use it, but we want to have it behind us. And uh, so I'd say tech for that system, uh, the key technologies going into the future are uh, uh, one, no surprise, building a much more reliable kill vehicle, which has had some problems over the years. Uh, number two would be bringing down the cost of sensors, whether it's radars or uh, IR or visible sensors on airplanes or something in space, bringing down the cost of sensors so we can have a much more uh, redundant and deep uh, global network of sensors so that you can fuse data. Uh, so the, and then uh, making use of those sensors to uh, uh, do much more robust, robust tracking and target identification. Okay. Move we'll to you, Richard, sort of moving from the, the, the broad down. You want to you go next? I'm just worried if my socks match since I'm kind of hanging out here. Am I right? <laughs> it's a stoic crowd out there. Um, <laughs> uh, so I would, I would just open up with uh, just a comment on our command. You know, you talk about technologies. Uh, the Space and Missile Defense Command, U.S. Army uh, RSTRAT, has a uh, responsibility to go from the, the infamous mud to space. You know, we have uh, the overhead capabilities, the space, the, the small satellites. The, the, uh, our soldiers drive, drive the satellites, not, not in the Air Force way, the real big satellite. We drive all the data on all, all the satellites. We're the gateway for uh, capabilities in there. Uh, high altitude, which is what I believe is one of the next big things for us, 60,000 uh, feet and above, you know, somewhere between a small sat and uh, in, the, in the regular air and missile defense area. Uh, you roll down into homeland defense where our soldiers are, are manning the, uh, the, the missile fields at Vandenberg and up in Fort Greeley, Alaska. Uh, and then uh, our responsibility to be the air and missile defense integrator for the Army uh, across the board. We talk about new, new re, uh, capabilities like Directed energy. SMDC is also the proponent, this is starting to sound like a commercial, a proponent for the directed energy, the high energy laser program. We're in all these areas, we're exploring those capabilities. And lastly, we follow the threat. As you, as you read in the news, things like uh, boost glide capabilities, uh, high, al uh, high altitude capabilities that are coming at us, 
we have to worry about those and also uh, develop the, those technologies to put back into the force. Great. Tom, you want to? Well, uh, you know, the, I think the interesting thing for uh, us to throw out is uh, there's a lot of great technology within uh, the country. Um, it's trying to bring it home uh, in the speed in which we're able to do that. Um, anybody that's run a development program or anybody that's had the opportunity to be involved in a development program, um, it is difficult to, to navigate uh, through the total system. So the question really gets down to with the threat uh, capacity that we're seeing and the evolution of the threats so rapidly, will, can our design process, our development process, sustain a pace to keep up with the threat? And I think we need to think about that a little bit because the, uh, when we have these uh, technologies and it takes us 10 to 15 years to get them into the field, it's a difficult scenario. You know, we're, we're now in the pursuit of repurposing. Um, I think we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, I think that is a, a, a near-term excellent uh, methodology of using an existing capability and, and, and putting it into a different environment or a different launcher or a different sensor suite um, and then giving, uh, get that uh, capability to the warfighter. But uh, we need to really grasp uh, our uh, ability um, to go deliver technology um, and do it in a manner in which we can expediently do it uh, to meet the threat content that's coming out. Well, uh, Richard, you mentioned the uh, following the threat uh, and the presidential mandate for the Missile Defense Review, the Ballistic Missile Defense Review, uh, asks, among other things, it directs the uh, department to go uh, look at the rebalance or the potential rebalance between homeland uh, and regional uh, defense. Uh, and I guess I might sort of pose to you all, um, in light of where you see the threat going, uh, should how might that rebalance be tilting one way or the other? And if, is there a way to think about it that perhaps doesn't look at it as a, a pie with winners and losers, but things that we could do across BMDS that, as it were, raises all boats, regional and homeland? Well, you ask about integration, and you, you, can, you can turn around and say, uh, what's, what's missing in integrated air and missile defense and the, its integration? Uh, we've been working at it, I don't mean that in a bad way, uh, we've been working at it for an awful long time and, and had, as evidenced by IBCS, for example. If you're going to integrate all the other pieces, you have to have a command and control system that can handle that. If you look across the gray area from the BMDS system down to um, a future maneuver shore ed guy, can, can they take advantage of something that full, you know, the sensor capability in the ballistic missile defense arena, like a, a forward deployed uh, TPY2 radar, for example, it's the uh, same as the THAAD radar. Can they take advantage of that to, to provide a targeting capability or, or some other piece? So one of the things we worry about, again, in the, uh, in the requirement side of this is the integration of C2BMC, the command and control activity for a BMDS, and our integrated I IBCS and, and eventually being able to take something that wasn't purposed originally for integrated air missile defense and being able to fire one of these uh, one of these separate shooters. We thought about it for a long time. Uh, look at some of the programs that we've had down the line. We've mentioned several of them. We're starting to come to fruition for the warfighters. Okay, the folks. Well, I I agree with Richard. Uh, the uh, the integrated portion of it is highly important to complete the layered uh, defense that we uh, need to provide. Um, and uh, you know we have all this uh, information that is floating out there, fusing it together in a way in which the commanders can go off and decide on what they need to do, when they need to do it, um, and uh, for whatever threat that is there, um, is the the only solution that's going to really come to light. Um, and I'm glad to hear that you think we're doing good at it. Uh, it's hard to tell sometimes, uh, but uh, we need to continue to pursue it. Yeah, I can give a specific example I think would be uh, quite valuable and uh, important to pursue. So uh, uh, for the Navy and for, uh, for MDA, uh, Raytheon actually has been building the standard missile, uh, the SM-3, the Block 2, and now the Block 2A is being tested. This is a very powerful interceptor in terms of its ability to fly out fairly long ranges, fairly high altitudes, hits targets uh, when they're above uh, uh, the atmosphere. Uh, that There's been a lot of analysis that's been done, I'd say, going back uh, 10, 15 years that shows that, especially with something like uh, the Block 2A, 
the SM3 Block 2A, you could actually have a very effective underlayer to the current GMD system. So you could uh, shoot long and far with the, the uh, GBI EKV and then uh, basically an underlayer of the standard missile uh, queued by the same sensor network uh, for uh, homeland defense. That would be taking something that was developed for uh, regional defense and directly integrating it for homeland defense. And put that on land uh, from a land-based yeah. capability as well. And Absolutely. And, okay, so that begins to blur uh, these categories a bit, but what about on the sensor side? Um, and I'm thinking especially of space sensors. Uh, every, each of the last five presidential administrations has had a space-based sensor layer as a critical element of our long-range missile defense plans on paper. But none of them have filled it yet. Um, we've heard hearing some noise about that. Uh, you know, it's one of those things that helps the long-range stuff, helps the shorter-range stuff to some extent as well. Um, and it clearly blurs, right, the, the re homeland regional side. Your thoughts on that, uh, that uh, pursuit? Well, it's a great question. <clears throat> I'll tell you, we're focused on the technology side on the small sat. And let's, let's define a small sat as something that's in, you know, low Earth orbit. Or maybe something glued to the bottom of a high altitude platform. The same kind of thing. Or maybe it flies by on a balloon of some sort. Uh, still up there in a, in a constellation. So capabilities up there are, are vastly required. Um, we as a community are looking at uh, what's the possibility of integrating the F-35, for example, with its great capabilities into our integrated air and missile defense. Uh, we're going we're gonna to study that over the next month or so as a, as a possibility. You know, we have a great capability. Let's bring it in and see where it could contribute as, a, as an overhead asset. Uh, that's where we're driving for well, folks. Well, my, my, my perspective is that we need overhead assets. Um, and uh, the small sats, I think, play a role in that. Uh, and uh, I, if you think about cheaper and if you think about expediency and if you think about uh, numbers, um, we, we, that is a path uh, to get there. But the other side, too, is that when you talk about sensor and, and real-time uh, information, um, you know, when, we, when these effectors that we're, we're shooting... Uh, uh, can also be a sensor and to communicate back and to fulfill real-time battlefield assessments in real-time battlefield situations. Um, so we need to get down a little bit into our thoughts as far as moving forward as well. Um, that uh, is a, a, a real source of data that right now we're not taking advantage of. Yeah, well, I, I agree that space is a very interesting place. We can leverage a lot of the technologies that are being uh, developed for commercial purposes. Uh, it's not unusual now for people, at least in the Department of Defense, to be seriously considering constellations of 50 to 100 small satellites, whereas five years ago they would have dismissed those as ridiculous uh, because of the commercial uh, side is, is demonstrating them now. But I wouldn't forget the radars. So the, the initial integration after the ABM, we withdrew from the ABM treaty, uh, the initial insight, at least for really trying to uh, uh, do better at homeland defense, was to bring the radars closer to the threat. So the radars are already there if they're there for regional and tactical purposes. So one way that technology could really help is if we could bring down the cost of an individual THAAD radar or a Patriot radar by anywhere from a factor of somewhere between 5 and 10, uh, then you could think about buying lots of them having a, a large network of radars. There'll be a lot of resiliency there. There's a lot of radars to take out. And actually, the same uh, advantage that you can use for small sets, there's a lot of work going on uh, for miniaturizing electronics, doing uh, mass production, of course, for iPhones and so forth. We can leverage those com very well understood commercial applications by tweaking our requirements for our military radars and uh, using those commercial production techniques, we're actually demonstrating right now, not for the uh, DOD, but for the FAA and for NOAA, uh, some prototypes that will be at least five times less expensive than current phased array radars will be, and still have a very long range uh, capability. But you still gotta put them somewhere. And as MDA used to say, uh, there's only so many islands in the Pacific. <clears throat> there's a lot of ships in the Navy though. Yeah. No. Uh, well, I, you know, actually, General Spellman brought up the uh, 
the, the North Korea drone problem. It's kind of the combined arms problem. And if that drone had been carrying something else and headed to that tippy two, we'd be in a world of hurt uh, in that respect. Uh, and so it really speaks to the resiliency problem uh, uh, as well, single points of failure. Um, Richard, I, I want to follow up on another thing that you said. Uh, you said we've kind of been chasing the integrated part of integrated air and missile defense for a long time. Uh, it, it, I, I reminded a little bit of uh, Moby Dick. You know, it's that big white whale we've been chasing. And what happened, I mean, what's it going to take to catch it? And what do we do when, you know, if we, if we, can, if we can get there? After integration, what? Well, so that's a great question, too. Uh, and I, I could probably spin you an answer about space, since I'm from Space Missile Defense Command. But let's just go back into ancient history. Uh, General Spillman made a comment about uh, dedicated resources. Uh, it, we, haven't not, we haven't not fielded stuff because we didn't want to, or we didn't know what the requirements needed to be, or we didn't see, foresee this. We just haven't had a stream of funding into a program that allows us to complete it. I mean, go back through the, the SLAM RAMs, the uh, J lenses, the, uh, the MEADS programs. All these things have had 360 degree capability. They've had integration capability. They've had new ways to bring things in. Uh, and as we stretch them out, pieces go away. And so you chip away at each one of those little programs from an acquisition standpoint. And pretty soon, you've got a requirement uh, that's way up here, and you can only meet this piece of it. And then we go into the classic argument about the requirements and, and whether or not you, what it is that you're going to do. What's changed now is we talk about um, capabilities, the new, the new vice is on, he's starting to ask these questions. Um, why can't I just have it uh, cheaper, quicker, next week, and all that kind of stuff? And the counter, all the acquisition guys turn right back to him and says, okay, you have this requirement, what is it you want me to deliver? Best efforts is something that industry does. You know, we, we can't just give you, the laser is a good example. You know, the, our warfighters say, why can't you give us one of these right now? We see them, we see it. Uh, the Navy does it with the, with the Ponce, why can't we have one? And, and our response ends up being something like, okay, maybe you don't want to kill a thousand things in one second. What, do you want to kill one thing in one second? Give me that requirement, I'll give you, I'll deliver you something that fits along those lines. So we, as we blur the requirements and the, and the, the funding streams and, and what it is we can deliver, uh, we got to put some more emphasis back into that process. Yeah, and that's exactly what, the opposite of what uh, <laughs> folks want to do is remove the process. And that's really what you were saying uh, uh, about, uh, the, about uh, uh, Richard, speed. Richard and, and General Spillman, uh, I loved what he said about let's just go test something, right? So uh, you know, you're, you're talking about somebody who's been developing stuff for 35 years, and uh, the things that we do in industry to try to go uh, birth something. Um, we generally have a very difficult time getting material early. We generally have a very difficult time convincing people that if we fail, it's okay. Uh, we have a very difficult time with the, the, the uh, actual publications going around that uh, Raytheon did this and Raytheon did that and oh my God, it didn't work. And no one's listening to folks like me that saying, look at all the stuff we learned. Look at the stuff that we're gonna go off and be able to incorporate back in to make the, the whatever we're developing better. Um, the other thing is, is that uh, this 80% uh, uh, solution versus 90% solution versus 100% solution, I've absolutely been on programs where that one-tenth of 1% 1 requirement is very, very difficult to obtain. And sometimes we get into a non-negotiable state, and we have to go spend a lot of money to obtain it because it's really important for something. Um, and then you wonder if that something is that important. And uh, so you got to consider, and there's a balance here of what you can deliver to get into the warfighter's hands uh, and make sure that they got some capability that's a heck of a lot better than they had previously versus do we continue to fight for the next 10 years on that one certain thing. <laughs> but, but the good news is that things are, have, have changed. I mean, in the old days, you had a requirement and you had to, you had to meet it or you failed, period. <clears throat> Nowadays, we have the flexibility from a... A re user requirement to almost go through that that uh, cave piece of you know cost as an independent variable. I can build you one of these, and here's a shopping list on what the rest of it can be. That's how we. It's one of the uh, issues with, with JLens when we were developing it. We got to a point where we couldn't meet, you know, one the one last mile, and so we argued over and over uh, industry to government on how to get that last mile, and we finally decided that one last mile wasn't as important as getting the capability that we uh, we finally delivered. Yeah, and, I, and I can personally tell you that happens on some programs. <laughs> that doesn't happen on, it's not, a, it's not an industry nor government partnership that this is what we are going to do. 
Um, and, it, and I believe that it will change the time scale and it change the affordability of what we do for a living. Mark, can I shoot that to you in, in the form of a question about directed energy? Mm -hmm. We've kind of been five years away from that for 20 years, too. Mm -hmm. where, where do we stand? Yeah, I can answer that. As a lab guy? Yeah, let me answer. <laughs> let me just, uh, just something Whatever. that came to mind as my uh, colleagues were talking. When you talk about integrated air and missile defense, I like the idea of integrating the air with missile defense. So we haven't yet deployed a lot of missile defense sensors that are on uh, airplanes air vehicles of some sort. We've done some experimentation, but this is a rich area. Uh, the technology is there now. You might not be able to lift a heavy radar, but you can lift very long range uh, infrared sensors mm -hmm. above most of the uh, sensible atmosphere. They can track missiles at very long ranges. They can do very interesting things. Uh, it, usually the, 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 question, the, the, the uh, contrary uh, point that's brought is that it's expensive to have these up 24-7. You need a lot of them. But I'll just say, you know, for hunting terrorists, we had no problem in uh, getting lots of uh, predators and reapers up there all the time, getting all kinds of ISR over Baghdad 24-7. Missile defense is important. We can afford to do it. And uh, there's also a lot to be said for getting those sensors on uh, mobile platforms. A little harder for the enemy to to deal with that. So on the laser thing, yes, the conventional wisdom has been, uh, uh, it's always five years out, 10 years out. I think we're that this, I think we're truly at a uh, inflection point for bringing high energy lasers into the whole Department of Defense. And it brings me back to the same thing I've been stating. It's not actually what's leading the way isn't actually the DOD investment so much. It's the work that's been done on the commercial side. So the, uh, you can go out on the internet and see these incredible videos of uh, cutting and welding tools made out of uh, one to one and a half kilowatt fiber lasers that can just rip hundreds of holes in uh, 100 milliseconds. So industry, uh, there's quite a few firms that have done this. This is now a well-developed technology. Uh, now, it's hard to bring our one kilowatt laser uh, within a, you know, a meter of a, of a ballistic missile. So we have to do something, but the technology is there. And what we can do is we can gang up many of these fibers and have them act uh, coherently, just like you'd gang up many transmit and receive modules for a phased array radar. Each one might be low powered, but you'd get enough of them together and enough of them might be a hundred. Then you can have a coherent beam that's a very high quality that can then propagate for very long ranges. So the fact that the key thing here is all that technology is here, but it's supported by a very deep industrial base that's going to continue developing it a uh, long time into the future. So I think uh, it's basically pretty amazing. You could build now uh, very high power, la all electric lasers that have about 50% efficiency, which is astounding. And, the, and if you go back 10 or 15 years, People were happy if they could build high energy lasers that had 5% efficiency. Do you think we'll ever get away from chemically powered rockets killing other chemically powered rockets in the foreseeable future, though? Uh, well, well, what's foreseeable? How far out you want to go? Mm -hmm. 25 <laughs> years? What? No, not in five years, but I think... Oh, 25. Oh, 25. I think we're going to see high energy lasers uh, playing a, a big role in air-to-air -air defense ground air defense and air to ground uh, offensive activities. It may not, it's not going to replace everything, but uh, there's going to be a big role for it. Okay. Yeah, the, the, the laser technology, uh, it, it's a, it, it is really truly a packaging uh, challenge for, for us and um, trying to uh, develop uh, something that is tuned to what we want it to be tuned for and to collectively be able to transmit the, the beam. But there's a lot of stuff that goes along with it. And a lot of stuff has to be mobile for the general. It has to be able to be packaged in some level to be able to fly. And it has to be reliable. And so all of those things industry has not handled uh, collectively yet into something that I foresee um, that we could put out there in the next 10 years. So, so can I say something? <coughs> so no, having, you're not allowed. <laughs> you drive, throw me that softball. So having, having been the guy that managed every high energy laser program that the Army's ever had, with the exception of one in 1974, and that was my father, 
Um, uh, mobile test unit. We, we were shooting helicopters out of the sky in the early 70s. Um, I, I agree and disagree somewhat. Okay, uh, I would tell you the Department of Defense jointly across all the services drove the technology to get us to where we are uh, on laser technology, the, uh, the fiber lasers. I, uh, I, really, I firmly believe that. And we asked industry to come in and tell us what you've got that's better than what we've already pulled together and, and, and you can read about the, the results of that. Uh, the, the question goes back to now that we have solid state lasers. All right, by solid state, I mean a fiber laser. It looks like a module. You plug it in. If you want twice the power, you make two of them, <coughs> plug them back in. If one breaks, it just it degrades very, very gracefully. Uh, it, I, we're taking delivery at the SMBC. We took delivery of a 60 kW laser last month. It's being integrated by uh, Amardec into, uh, and, and other folks and some of the industry that's in the room now into a HIMIT. The only thing that's offensible that is it's a Hemet. We don't want to give you a Hemet, uh, Chris. We, we're going to give you a, uh, <laughs> you take the same laser and we can put it into a striker, by the way. We've seen the, the fit and function. But what, what, what we're being desperately asked for is give me one of those so we can go use it. I mean, that's, mm -hmm. a, that's the most valid point here is, is how do we do it when we get it? It took the, uh, the Ponce almost an entire year to get the authority to use their laser out in, uh, in, the, in, the, uh, in, in theater. So we're, in, we're following uh, that same exact model. We've taken low power lasers, we've shot down the UAVs, but you take a, the same, I say low power, 10 kW, take a 10 kW la laser and open it up so it's not trying to kill something, and you can dazzle a sensor 30 plus kilometers away. So is, it, is that a useful capability? It probably is. You've got a huge optic that's, that's doing that focusing. I can use that for ISR purposes. So. We talk about the uh, cost exchange ratio or the loss exchange ratio. We talk about the cost exchange ratio because that's one of the only ways we can kill some of these low and slow and, and uh, hard to see kind of target demonstrations. Well, well, General Spillman gave the Nike injunction. Just go do it, he said, right? No, that's right. Yeah. Uh, got time for a couple questions? Right here in the front, and we got a mic. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Colonel Gert Schijvenaars uh, from the uh, Defense Material Organization of the Netherlands. Uh, we have now uh, had a discussion this hour on uh, integration, air missile defense as a, a future option. Uh, we've talked about uh, sensors, we've talked about uh, effector shooters. Uh, I'm interested in, uh, in relation to the future of missile defense. How are you looking at uh, cyber attacks, and and what are what are we going to do about that? Because that's I think uh, a point that's not been discussed. Uh. We can talk about it from an offensive or a defensive standpoint. If you look, at, we've talked about um, in here multi-domain battle, multi-domain multi-domain task force. The one there are several courses of action going through the Department of Defense on what the multi-domain task force looks like. One of the only things that's common to all of the courses of action is an integrated uh, cyber electronic warfare and space unit. So there's, we, we, we've taken the step of going across all the, the domains of space, uh, cyber, you're going to have to deliver those effects in some way, um, and electronic warfare. And instead of arguing over who owns the domain, we've now brought together a capability so that uh, from our force standpoint, we can use, use that capability. Um, I, I can, you know, talk briefly about vulnerabilities. Every, you recognize everything has a cyber vulnerability of some sort. Depends on what the cyber is. Uh, in the in the U.S., we take uh, system ownership, and in SMBC, for example, we have ownership uh, from a on a very small group of things because our material developer, the Missile Defense Agency, really is the system owner, and so we drive the requirements to them, uh, and it's it's one of our number one requirements uh, back to them, and they they satisfy those. At a, at a rate that probably isn't as quick as we'd like to see it happen. Anybody else on cyber? Uh, it, well, let, oh, go ahead. It's in process. I mean, we're, we are doing it. Well, let me actually redirect that a little bit differently, which is that, you know, I think frequently when folks bring up the cyber thing, um, you know, reporters, something like that on the offensive side, you know, I think the sense is let's just wave our magic cyber wand and make this Hwasong 14 go away. Uh, and yet, and I've heard you know one smart missile guy say, you know these things are designed not to be hacked. It's kind of like hacking a pepper grinder. And so, my question for you is, if there's a missile defense, uh, armed missile defense guy, 
um, what degree of confidence or how many eggs ought we put into the basket of killing these things left of launch with EW or cyber? Yeah, well, it's, it's, it's sure they're designed to be, so our systems are divine, right. designed to be robust against cyber attacks, or maybe we're designing them now to be robust against cyber attacks. But they have large, you know, North Korea, they have no magic uh, tricks. They're procuring lots of stuff. They've got a, they, they're not, you know, their, their tells and their command and control just doesn't grow out of the ground. It has electronic parts. It has apertures. It's connected. Uh, somebody's got to give the order. Uh, it's got to be communicated to uh, the missile. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of infrastructure. So I wouldn't say it's just that the missile is designed to be robust. Yeah, so we all have a fantasy that we're going to get to the point where we'll have uh, regular bullets, we'll have missiles, and we'll have cyber bullets. Uh, it's a little, Obviously, we know it's a lot more complicated than that. It's really, there's a whole preparation of the battlefield that might involve the supply chain that has to happen for five or ten years. Uh, but, you know, God willing, we don't need it for another, you know, five or ten years. But if you don't start now, you won't have it then either. So I, I would say usually the sort of, to get deep, to really talk about anything that's happening in the cyber domain, you have to do at a classified level. It's hard, hard to say much, but it's obviously something that I think everyone's looking at very seriously. Anything else on that? I, I think we'll, we will fix the cyber problem right about the time I'll get into an autonomous vehicle and ask it to take me home. <laughs> well, you can do that today. Like I said, I don't think I would get into that car just yet. Uh, well, why, let me let me just close uh, out with sort of any ending remarks that you have on how we get to integrated the I and IAMD in the near term. You know, a couple couple quick recommendations you all have for the, the the near term of how do we integrate everything better. Well, I talked about mud to space. You know, uh, in, in the vernacular, uh, we another function that uh, that our boss has us driving through is integrating the capabilities. You know, what, what can space do to, imp to implement a capability over on the missile defense side? Can you use space-based assets to do things? Can you use it for targeting? Uh, we have to integrate space and global ballistic missile defense. Some folks go, what? Those two things don't even match. But when you st sit back and think about the assets that are associated with that, with advanced threats, how you have to track advanced threats, how you can engage them, there is a great integration piece. So, so we're in, you know, I have a, a TICM a trade out capability manager who worries about integration of C2BMC capability on the GMD side, integrating into IBCS uh, on, the, uh, on the air and missile defense side. So we're working on it. We're not there yet. All right. Any closing recommendations for you all? No? Yeah, I would say something that we haven't talked about is uh, in integration into command and control systems because in the end, you know, the warfighters got to control the sensors, the shooters, everything else. Building these sorts of uh, command and control systems to have uh, open interfaces that are well-defined, sort of an open architecture that all of industry buys into that's uh, very, and really what it means is there's well-defined components that build up your system, well-defined subsystems, and the interfaces are well-defined so that uh, as long as you build to that interface, you know it's going to integrate uh, fairly readily. And this has been demonstrated quite a bit in the last four or five years on the Air Force side, they call it open mission systems. They're having a lot of success. I think we really need that on the uh, missile defense side. We haven't gotten there where the radars, uh, this, uh, all the sensors and the command and control are much easier to uh, tie together. So when you develop a new radar for uh, Patriot, it'll, all, it'll just integrate seamlessly into the BMDS. I, I think you have to have it. My, my two words would be you have to commit to it. Uh, or is that three words? Yeah, but uh, the simple process is, is that you have to go off and design this thing from the top down. And, uh, you know, Mark is dead on about the, the standards in which we need in the, at the interfaces as well as at the, uh, the code level. Well, folks, this has been a, a pleasure for me. Uh, we're, I think we have a reception afterward. I want to thank the hosts, and please join me in giving the panel a, a round of applause.